Uh, my general research interest is in the gap between values and practices. What we think we should do, what we want to do, what we're trying to do versus what we actually do. Uh, and what I'd like to do uh, today is, is talk about an application of that interest on the gap between scientific values and practices, particularly on openness uh, and reproducibility, and what happens in daily practice uh, in our laboratories and in uh, scientific communication more generally, uh, and how we might think about ways to uh, improve the alignment uh, between the daily practice of science and what we aspire uh, for science to be. Uh, so the, I, I will have a little bit of data, but it's mostly uh, a presentation of a strategy that we're taking through the Center for Open Science uh, with the hope that you'll have some feedback for that on where you think the approach uh, can improve, where you think it can provide value for you, uh, because the Center exists as, is functionally a service organization. It exists as an independent nonprofit, uh, and it doesn't sell anything, and it doesn't have any intellectual property. It builds stuff uh, and gives it away with the hope that it has some value uh, for researchers in doing uh, their research, but then facilitates uh, improvement uh, in the practices that we're trying to do uh, every day. Uh, so the critical feedback on that will be most welcome. Uh, but for this, let me begin uh, with what the, the sort of the core assumptions or values that uh, scientists may or may not hold uh, in how science should be done. Uh, and Robert Merton, the sociologist of science, did a fair bit of work on this in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, on describing the, the norms of science. Uh, and I just want to review those uh, as recognition factors of what is it that we are here uh, in the business to do, uh, or at least how is it uh, that we aim to do it. Uh, and one of the core norms is communality, right? The, when we make a scientific claim, uh, we make available the basis of that claim. How, what's the evidence? Uh, what's the methodology we use to generate the data? What are the data? What are the analysis strategy? Uh, we expose those things that are the basis of that claim so that they can be critiqued, extended, uh, revised uh, among the community of other experts, right? Versus the counter norm of secrecy, of keeping all that information as uh, one's own intellectual property for commercial or competitive advantage in some kind. A second norm he identified is universalism, that the research is evaluated on the merit itself, right? The research is its own evidence for its value, uh, rather than particularism, that we evaluate research by the reputation of those who generated it or who made the claims. A, a third is disinterestedness. Scientists are motivated by the knowledge and discovery, just the curiosity of wanting to know things. Uh, as compared to the counter norm of self-interestedness, treating science as a competition, beating the person down the hall uh, uh, to the, that finding or that effect or that prize, whatever it may be. Right? A fourth, uh, organized skepticism. So a scientist considers all the new evidence, uh, even that against one's own prior work, and maybe even embraces that that is counter to one's work as an opportunity to learn something new. My assumptions were not correct here. Isn't that an exciting discovery? Uh, versus organized dogmatism, investing my career in promoting my initial ideas and beliefs and defending those against all the attackers and detractors who have uh, different theoretical positions than mine. Uh, and while Merton didn't discuss it, many others who have thought about the norms and uh, values of science have also raised uh, quality uh, as a norm as opposed to the counter norm of quantity, that we try to do very good work, uh, not just a lot of it. Uh, and, uh, and there's others that have been raised, but these uh, five uh, are many of the ones that are discussed uh, most frequently uh, as the norms of science. Uh, now, Anderson and her colleagues uh, in 2007 wanted to evaluate the endorsement of these norms. Do people actually agree with them, or is it just Merton uh, talking to himself about what the norms of science are? Uh, and what they did was they did a survey of two groups, uh, early career here, uh, are people who are in NRSA or equivalent kinds of postdoc mechanisms through NIH. Uh, Mid-career are those who had just achieved their first uh, R01, so average age around 40 years old uh, for uh, that group. And they had about 3,500 respondents. And what I'm showing you here on the x-axis is the cumulative uh, percentage of the uh, respondents to the survey. And the gray bar indicates those that endorse the norms over the counter norms uh, from the prior slide. Uh, whereas the black portion proportion is those who endorse the counter norms 
over the norms. And the Hatches are people who basically evaluated these as equally, uh, or endorsed them equally. Uh, so as you can see, 90% you know, or more of uh, all the scientists surveyed said that the norms are what they endorse as well. So then they said, okay, don't tell me what you endorse, tell me what you do in your daily work. Uh, and it shifted some like this. Uh, so still, most people, 60% or so in both groups, are saying that they practice by the norms of science, although many more people are acknowledging that the counter norms also influence their behavior, uh, and a small increase uh, in the number of people who said, no, the counter norms are what uh, drive my behavior over the norms. So then they said, okay, don't tell me what you do, tell me what everyone else around you does uh, in your field, uh, and that's what it looks like. So, People say that I value these things, I try to practice by them, and all the other duds in my field are doing it all the other way. They're all in it for themselves, they're dogmatic about their findings, they're keeping all of them, their stuff for themselves, and they're not practicing by the values of science. Now, anyone that has been studying human behavior since Psych 101 knows that this is a very difficult uh, circumstance to be in. If you believe that the culture practices very different than your values, then behaving by the values that you have is very difficult. All of these people are doing things to advantage themselves in the career. They're doing things that will get them jobs, help them keep jobs, because, but they're doing it in a cynical way against the norms of science, where I want to practice by the ideals, but then I'm confronted with this choice of behave by the ideals and disadvantage my career, or advantage my career and give up my ideals. And that's a very difficult bind for anyone to be in, uh, for any kind of practice that they want to have. And so there is a perception, at least, whether or not it's reality, that people have choices to make between their, daily, their values uh, and the practices that they're going to abide by in their everyday research. And that behavioral challenge, that perception gap or reality gap, is one that we aim uh, to try to address. Uh, and so the, uh, what I'd how I'd like to organize uh, what I present is giving you sort of an introduction to the Center for Open Science and how it is we're trying to do this uh, organizationally uh, and then hope that some of the uh, products and services and things that we're doing will have some interest or feedback from you. Uh, the general mission of the Center is to improve openness, integrity, reproducibility of scientific research. Uh, and we have three core activities, uh, infrastructure, building tools, software development, uh, for uh, making things that are easy and helpful for researchers to do things that they're trying to do today. Uh, community building, uh, building new incentives uh, and working with the various stakeholders in science across the entire ecosystem to try to make it possible for people to behave by uh, their values and still succeed in science. Uh, and then meta-science, doing active research on scientific practices itself. Uh, so like doing large-scale replication projects and seeing what is the reproducibility rate and what predicts re reproducibility across disciplines. And we have a couple of big projects, one in psychology, uh, another in cancer biology, and we have a few uh, that are emerging in some other fields uh, like those. I won't get too much into those, but I'm happy to talk about them uh, later. Uh, the center itself is an independent 501c3. We have a staff of 40 or so uh, right now, and most of them uh, are doing uh, software development. So we're basically a tech startup, uh, and there are some scientists there too uh, that are doing uh, things with it. So that just gives you some general context of uh, what it is that the center is about. And I'll, I'll just review a, a briefly sort of the general strategy and then sh show you some of the things that we're trying to do uh, to engage uh, uh, long-term solutions uh, to these issues of openness and reproducibility. Uh, the first is to build technology to enable people to change, right? If we don't have the tools available to actually do practices in a way that's more open, to actually make our research workflow more transparent, uh, then asking people to change or giving them incentives to change isn't going to be enough. Uh, second is that we have training services to help people enact the changes. If they want to have a more reproducible workflow, how do I do that? What kinds of tools can I use? How do I use those tools? Uh, so we have training, free training services now for implementing some of these things. Uh, and then the, the key, of course, is that you can build anything you want, but if there are no incentives to use it, then people will not use it and it won't make any difference. Uh, and so we have to address the incentives for what's good for me and what's good for science and try to make those the same thing. Uh, so I'll first uh, talk about uh, the technology. I won't spend a lot of time uh, on training services other than to say that we have them and if you go to the website you can email and get free services. Um, 
and then I'll come back to uh, and focus on the incentives part uh, because I think that's where a lot of the interesting uh, discussion emerges about how to address these issues should we want to address them at all. So for the technology, our primary service is called the Open Science Framework. Uh, it is a web application. It's already freely available, so you can go to osf.io uh, and sign up uh, for an account. And the basic goal of the OSF is to provide support for researchers to manage their own research workflow. Uh, so it is a project management system at the most abstract level of doing research. Uh, where we accumulate stuff and we need to store that stuff. We need to be able to communicate with our collaborators and we need to be able to maintain that. And it aims to solve a problem that researchers have right now with their workflow as they use it right now. And I can illustrate that with sort of an amalgam example of something that happens in my lab all of the time. So Anoop is a third year grad student. We have weekly meetings. We're having a conversation about some research idea during our meeting. Uh, and I say, oh my gosh, this is just like this project that Nicole and I did a couple of years ago. Uh, and we never went anywhere with it because she graduated, went off into industry. Uh, and so it's dead. It's, so maybe you could pick that up as pilot data and then take it uh, into this new direction as you're describing it. He says, that's great. So I say, okay, let me go get it on my machine. And so I go to my machine and I look and I say, oh, well, I don't have any of those materials. Nicole was the leader of the project, so we'll have to email her. Uh, for it. And so I email her and because she's in industry, three weeks later she responds and she says, what project are you talking about? And so we have some back and forth over time about what the project is. She says, oh yeah, I remember that, but I don't have it on my machine here because I'm, that was an old machine, so I'm not to go look at my storage files to try to find that stuff. Uh, so a few weeks pass and I send her some reminders. Remember that thing? I say, oh yeah, yeah, okay, I'll look for it. Uh, and then she one day sends me this huge email and says, Oh, okay, I, I found it, at least I think I found it. Uh, there's four different versions of the materials. I can't remember which one we actually ran, uh, because remember we were talking about these different variations that we could do, and we did one of them. Uh, and here's the data, but I don't have a code book because I never bothered to clean that up, and so I can't really understand it. Uh, but maybe Anoop will find all of this and make some use of it. And so I send that to Anoop, and he looks at it and he says, I think I'm gonna work on a different problem. All right. So the, the problem that we confront all of the time, and we're a pretty organized lab, is that we lose our own materials for our own use. Uh, we are constantly not able to reproduce our own work in order to make better use of it uh, because we have ad hoc systems and we have collaborators coming in and out uh, and at very different places and that everybody has their own system for managing their own materials and data and there is little to no integration of that so that we can have confidence of what each project materials and data actually are. Uh, and so the OSF aims to solve that basic problem by having a common cloud-based interface for everybody to use that's on a project so that they can access their stuff for their own use. And if we can solve that problem, then the OSF provides value for how researchers are doing their work now. And we want to make, uh, not make researchers have to step anywhere away from their workflows as they exist, but rather improve their workflows as they're doing them. So I'll just give a brief description of some of the features uh, of the OSF so you can get an idea of how the platform is trying to implement that while simultaneously starting to give some handles on to make things, making the research itself more reproducible uh, and transparent. Uh, so that's the address. Uh, you can go in and sign up uh, either right now if you have a phone or later. Uh, so the, the first is this collaboration uh, documentation and archiving. So this is a project page. So when I log into my account, uh, I, have a, uh, I can create new projects. Uh, when I create projects, I can add contributors who are my collaborators to that pro with that project. Uh, there's wikis. I can push files uh, into the system. Uh, I can link up. Uh, other services that uh, are where files are stored. Uh, I can create components which are discrete parts of the research workflow uh, for different aspects of it, like different studies, uh, analysis plans, data as separate components, just helping organize it uh, in order to help manage those files. And so all of the other collaborators, when they, if I add them as a, as a contributor to this project, when they log into their system, they have access to this too. And I can give them different levels of access control. If they're an RA and should only be able to do some things, I can control how many things they can do. Uh, it also has in it version control. So it's version backed by Git now, although that uh, may be developing or changing. Uh, but it's a uh, version control system where every time a file is updated, uh, it is automatically versioned so that the prior versions are still available. 
So a lot of people have a rudimentary version control system in, for example, manuscript writing, where they're writing their manuscript, and when they're about to make a big change, they append the date to the end of the manuscript, or the end of the file, document file, and then save as, and then in their folder, keep a number of sequential dates of big versions of that file. This does that automatically uh, so that you can always ret uh, retrieve older versions and do change logs in order to understand what has changed uh, in the different files, whether it be data or manuscripts or materials or otherwise, uh, over time. It also intends to merge public and private workflows. So right now, if you wanted to make your data available publicly, most often that thought uh, and that action would occur after you're already done with the project. So I've achieved publication, and then the journal might ask me, do you want to make your data available because we have that service? And then I say, no, I'm done with that project. Uh, why would I add all of that extra work when I've already achieved the end goal, which was just to get published? Uh, so appending things onto people's workflow is not a good way to get them to do more things, especially when they have a lot to do already. So the service as a project management tool can be used entirely privately all of the time. Uh, so researchers can ha add their collaborators, allow them to work on all of this stuff, and it is a private, secure workspace for just them to look at and manage those tools. But there's a button on the top of every project and every component that says, make public. Uh, and if you ever decide to click that button, a little pop-up shows up and says, are you really sure you want to make that public? And then if you click, yes, I'm really sure, then that URL is now public. And so it can be discovered uh, through the search and discovery tools in OSF or just via Google or wherever else uh, so that others can find uh, and access and make use of that. And you have full access control. So if I have a project and I don't want to make the data available, but I'm willing to make the analysis plan or the uh, code book available so that others might discover things and then say, oh, you have those measures. Can we collaborate in order to do something else? Well, I can make just the pieces of the workflow available that I'm prepared uh, to share with others. Then once it's easy, so the, the main idea with that of integrating these workflows is to remove the technical and practical barriers for being open and just make it a matter of intention. Right? It just requires clicking twice. Uh, and if I'm willing to do that, then uh, I am now uh, made it a lot simpler on myself to make a lot of the things that I've been doing in the lab part of the public uh, discussion because it's a tool that I've already been using. I don't have to do extra work. But we also need to think about why would people uh, make their tools available. So there's a lot of work in altmetrics and trying to find ways to give people uh, reward or at least know what kind of impact they're having. And we do all of those sort of ordinary things like counting downloads so you can know how many times your materials have been accessed, uh, how many times your pages have been visited, is documented. Uh, and then we're building tools to facilitate citation automatically uh, in the system. So we adopt some tools from open source software development. Uh, Forks uh, is, a, is a very frequently used tool uh, or uh, style uh, in software development where someone else built something interesting, like say a, a new measure or a material or a procedure, and I think I can do something a little bit different with it uh, that would be interesting for my purposes. Well, I fork it into my uh, workflow. So now I have a version of that project that's linked back to the original and I make changes. Uh, then the link is always present. So there's a functional link. They built something that's of use to me, uh, and I've changed it and altered it. And then someone, if I make it available and someone else then extends it, then there's another link. And so the network of development of the tools, of data, of everything else that might change over time is retained as a functional network of how people are using and developing research. And then there's other simple things, like just creating links to things that you use. Uh, and then templates. If you create a version of a project that someone else provides, sees as particularly valuable, they can template it uh, and then make changes. And you get counts uh, for how you've done that. So it's basically just trying to surface a lot of things that happen that aren't in that singular uh, way of evaluating impact of citation counts of published articles. It also now links to the many components of that workflow. So that, for example, if you are someone who creates great analysis scripts, uh, and you hate writing, so you don't actually produce as many papers as you produce analysis scripts. Well, you can start getting citations of those analysis scripts uh, and get credit for that, even if tenure committees aren't yet prepared uh, to consider that a contribution. Uh, that is all linked to uh, the need for persistent identifiers. So every project and component 
has a permanent link uh, with an identifier associated with it. So there is something to cite uh, and a place to go in order to get that. Uh, and each project automatically generates uh, citations. So it make it very easy for people to cite a data set where they may not have thought of citing a data set as a research object before. Uh, but if we can make it very simple to do so, then people might start thinking differently about how citation can be used to credit things other than just uh, a final report. Uh, so that's all incorporated. There's also a, a feature called registration. Uh, and what registration does uh, is I have a link to my project and it's a particularly important time in the study. For example, with Nicole's study, uh, she couldn't remember which of four versions that she used. If we had had the system, uh, what would have been ideal is that on, at onset of data collection, she creates a registration. She freezes the data, at that the whole project at that point in time, uh, and that frozen version is always linked to the active project. So she can continue working with the project, but there's this frozen version that we record saying this is what the project was like at the onset of data collection. So we can always go to that and know exactly what the materials were uh, that were part of the project when it, when it actually started. Uh, this can also be used for pre-registration. So if we have a strong confirmatory hypothesis and we want to uh, give ourselves some handcuffs in how it is we analyze that data in order to show a strong confirmatory test, uh, we can register our analysis plan uh, and then, as long as we follow it, uh, we have a certification of some pre-registration of that, of that approach. Uh, so it has multiple potential uses. I should also mention that you can register privately. So people are worried, for example, about being open about their registration because someone else might scoop them. See that grand idea you had uh, and steal it and run it your, themselves before you can get it done. Well, the system does not require anything to be public, so you register privately, uh, and then you make that available uh, when you want to do so. And we can talk about some of the uh, interesting challenges that emerge with that. Uh, the last point I'll make about the uh, infrastructure is what the, where, where it's heading, and it's really to connect the services uh, that researchers use. So the main goal of the OSF is to link all of these different services in the workflow together to help ease transition costs. So you have different systems that you engage with, IRB, grant applications, data collection tools, data analytics tools, data visualization, where data is stored, uh, the publication manuscript systems. All of these require you to make a transition, getting out of something that you're doing and into something else, which is room for error, and it's also a disruption to reproducibility of what that workflow was. How is it that you got from place to place? And none of those systems can talk to each other. So the data analytics tools that we use don't easily connect to where it is we might store the data. We have to actively get those to be connected. Uh, or the visualization tools or the manuscript authoring. Uh, so what uh, OSF does is through API relationships is connect services all to a single source so that they can talk to each other. So we have a number of different services already connected. So if you use GitHub, you can connect a GitHub repo to your OSF project, and you can connect a Dropbox if you use Dropbox, and if you use Amazon S3, which is a, if you want very cheap, very large storage, uh, that's a very good resource to use. It's mostly not used by scientists uh, because there is some uh, uh, developer uh, uh, challenges to solve, but we've made a simplified interface to engage it much more easily so you don't have to have any of the technical knowledge. Uh, but all of those can be linked together in a single project, in a single file tree, so that you can work with those tools together and interactively. Uh, and then over time, uh, we aim to connect many more services across the entire workflow. So there are many things, for example, that researchers in social behavioral uh, neurosciences use uh, to help them with their research process. And if we can define API relationships between all of these things, then we can get them to communicate with each other uh, in addition to just helping to manage and monitor the workflow. So you can imagine, for example, that uh, when you're ready to push uh, an article uh, into the publication system, if we can connect the manuscript authoring uh, and typesetting process uh, with data storage and with analytics tools, uh, then we can make every inferential test uh, in your paper a link. Uh, and then when you click the link, it pops up the code that generated that test and the data that the code was applied to so that you can reproduce people's analyses as you read their paper 
And you say, well, I would have done a little bit differently. I would have added these covariates. I wonder what happens. And you add those on the fly and see what the new result is. So connecting these tools together provides an opportunity to do things in a much more interactive way with the research that you're consuming and the research that you're creating. Uh, and so that's sort of the long-term aim, is to connect the many hundreds uh, of services together uh, so that you can do much more, uh, more efficiently and more reproducibly. Okay, uh, so that's uh, part one on technology. And I want to move uh, for the last uh, part of the talk about to address some of the incentives challenges. And this is really where uh, it's, it's, a, it's easy to talk about uh, how we could do things, but actually getting to do things uh, is much more difficult. Uh, and to, before I get into some of the strategies, at least, that we're starting with, and I'll be very eager to get your feedback on those, I want to talk about the context in which uh, this occurs. And these are two titles of articles that appeared in Nature in 2011. Uh, believe it or not, how much can we rely on published data on potential drug targets, raise standards for preclinical cancer research. Uh, these two papers were uh, produced by two industrial laboratories, Bayer and Amgen, uh, respectively, who tried to reproduce uh, studies from high-impact articles in mostly oncology, but in a few other related fields, uh, in the sort of the pre-development uh, of uh, pharmaceuticals or other therapies. Uh, in, uh, for clinical practice, particularly for cancer. Uh, and you know, their routine is, let's get the result that the basic uh, research lab got, uh, and then we'll extend it into the you know, preclinical and then clinical stages of trials if it shows promise. Well, these two um, groups reported that they tried a few dozen uh, different studies uh, that were all very promising, lots of high impact uh, results. And they had respective success rates of reproducing the original results of 11% and 25% of these published articles. And of course, those are stunningly low numbers for anyone that says, well, how much should it be reproducible? Now, they made the, uh, both of them drew the conclusion implicitly or explicitly that the reason it was so low was because many of the published findings are false. Uh, rather than there may be other challenges for reproducing them, right? Like technical expertise, which they said, no, 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 there was no expertise challenges here. We're, we're expert. Uh, and, uh, and many other factors, right? The methods are not known. There may be unknown moderators. All of the various things that can be barriers to reproducibility may be real barriers, uh, but they may be much more extensive than we appreciate uh, when we're consuming uh, the literature that we look at, because 11 and 25% is quite low. Uh, there's also a, a very healthy uh, community emerging of meta-science, of studying the process of scientific research itself. Uh, this is a figure uh, that comes from one of Daniel Finelli's uh, projects, and he's done a lot of work uh, in this domain, uh, looking at, in this particular case, uh, the rates of positive results, supporting the tested hypothesis. Uh, so down at the bottom here is a percentage uh, where he reviewed a number of different fields, uh, and just counted how often did the reported studies support the, the, public, the hypothesis, showed a positive result for that effect. And from physics through uh, psychology, we're the winners. Uh, we had 85% to like 92% uh, positive result rate, which is a remarkable uh, rate of positive results uh, in the published literature. It's all the more remarkable when compared with uh, research about the power of studies to find uh, positive results. So we have a paper recently where we did a meta-analysis of meta-analyses uh, across neuroscience fields, a variety of uh, disciplines, low-level animal models to uh, imaging and other things. Uh, and we just estimated the power uh, of the research designs in those various meta-analyses. And what I'm showing you here on the x-axis is the median power uh, for those various meta-analyses. So there is a subset that have very, very high power, 90% or above. Uh, but uh, many uh, that were below 20%. The, the median was either 20 or 30% here. I can't remember. Uh, you might be able to count. Uh, but the, but if, uh, so say the median is somewhere around 20%. Uh, and what that means is that assuming that every effect being investigated is true, we would expect a positive result rate to be 20%. And as I showed you here, let's see, uh, neuroscience, about 85% positive result rate. So the expected value based on the power of designs is about 20%. Uh, to the extent that these are talking about the same population, we're seeing 85% uh, success rate. Those numbers don't line up. 
uh, it's not possible uh, that those two things could be true simultaneously unless some other things were occurring. And what those other things, oh, I don't have that yet. Uh, so we'll talk about, about what those other things, but there's some obvious ones, which is not everything that gets done gets reported. And there could be adventurous analytic strategies that make things look more significant uh, than they actually are. And these have been discussed uh, by many others. Uh, so that's uh, one element of the context of why there are concerns about reproducibility. Uh, another is, I uh, just want to mention briefly, is, a, um, is the extent to which we have certainty about the findings as we do them ourselves, uh, as we observe them. And this is a project that we're uh, just about ready uh, to submit. Um, and what I'm showing you here on the x-axis is an effect size. So it's in odd ra odds ratio terms. So one is no effect, uh, no association in this particular case uh, between the two key variables. Uh, and positive values here is a positive result uh, in the expected direction. And what I'm showing you are 28 uh, different teams who all investigated the same research question. Uh, and their mean estimated effect size uh, and the confidence, 95% confidence interval around that effect size. Uh, so you're seeing a, quite a bit of variability across the teams uh, in their estimated effect sizes for this research question. In this case, the question was, uh, are players with darker skin tone more likely to get red cards in soccer than players with lighter skin tone? Now, the interesting twist to this particular investigation, which had these 28 uh, different groups, there's actually 29. One is not here because the uh, confidence interval is so wide, uh, it didn't fit on the page. Uh, the interesting twist is that they all use the same data set. So we took a data set, said here is the question that we're interested in, who else wants to help analyze it? And 29 different teams did independent analyses of that data set testing the exact same question. Uh, and this is the range of uh, findings that they found. About two thirds of them found a positive effect, about one third of them uh, did not find an effect. And there was quite a bit of variability uh, in their responses. Now, what's even more stunning to me about that is that we had a two-stage process in this analysis. So the uh, teams uh, did their analysis, then they submitted them to us with the results, uh, and then we removed the results and just uh, shared, uh, put together the uh, analytic strategy, the exclusion rules, transformations, the model they used, everything else, uh, and then sent those back to all of the teams. Uh, and every team uh, peer-reviewed at least three others uh, analysis strategy, gave them feedback on the appropriateness of it, things that they might want to consider, et cetera. Uh, so they each saw many of the other analysis strategies and gave feedback. So you'd at least expect some convergence uh, on how it is they approached uh, the data. Uh, but this is the variability after the second round, after they considered all of that feedback uh, and then revised their analyses. Also, this is not a case where we have a few very inexpert uh, analysts and uh, some others that are highly expert or vice versa uh, because most of these teams are uh, made up of people who are instructors of statistics or methodologies at their respective universities or have published on methodology and statistics so we recruited a very highly expert uh, set of people uh, but there's a lot of choices that one makes and there many of the choices are very reasonable choices to make in data analysis uh, and yet those choices have implications for outcomes. Yes, please. Give us a hint. What's differing between them? Like, what are they doing differently? Yeah, so some of them use different models. I'm not showing you here. Like mixed effects versus a linear regression approach was the dominant difference to sort of simply characterize them. Uh, there were some differences in transformations or presumptions of how to code uh, the outcome. Uh, and then there were, different th there were differences like in covariates. So no, there's 29 teams. No two teams use the exact same set of covariates uh, in their analysis. They all had different choices of which kinds of covariates to include. Uh, so they're just, and which ones are the right ones? Well, it's not really, there isn't an answer to what are the right uh, covariates to use easily. People can debate reasonably about different choices. Uh, but all of those decisions uh, are ones that are just part of the process of doing research. And what we see in the average report is one of these analyses. But in this case, which one happened to have occurred had, would have had an impact of what the conclusion would have been drawn about the paper. Where in reality, uh, if many different people looked at the same data, we'd find very different answers. So this is a scenario where there's not necessarily motivation to get a particular outcome, 
But there is still a lot of variation in the outcomes just because there's many choices that we make as we're doing our research, as we're doing our analysis in what we're deciding to report that we don't easily appreciate as adding to great uncertainty in how to interpret the outcome as it is reported. And so the value in this case of transparency of that data is it's possible to observe that the, the finding is highly contingent on different choices made uh, in the analysis. And then the question is which, which one or ones of those analyses are most defensible. <laughs> so the more general uh, issue and rather just the flexibility of the choices that one makes uh, in analysis is how those uh, different choices can facilitate making research look better uh, in print uh, than it is in practice. So we're at the boundaries of knowledge, right? We're studying problems that are hard and we, that's why we're studying them. Uh, and that most of the data, at least that comes through my lab, is a mess. Uh, and it's a mess because we don't understand the phenomenon that we're investigating. Uh, but we're incentivized to, when we try to get it published, to make it the most novel, clean, beautiful, positive results story that we can because that's what makes for a higher likelihood of getting a publication in a higher prestige outlet. And of course, that's a good thing. We should be wanting novel, positive, uh, clean results because those are the best kind of results. But because we're working on hard problems, that's not what we're getting most of the time. And with a lot of flexibility in how we analyze our data, in what data and studies that we choose to report uh, or not, uh, and the flexibility in reconstructing our stories, uh, presenting hypothesis generated analysis. We do a lot of exploratory research uh, with our data because we learn a lot of things, especially unexpected things from our data. Uh, but the incentives are to present it as if we knew that all along, and that was our overriding hypothesis going into it. And we can't use the same data for hypothesis generating, hypothesis testing. Uh, they have to be tested uh, separately, but we're not incentivized to do that. And so we have a lots of tools at our disposal that we could use uh, and that are in our interest to use if our outcome of interest is in publish publication. Uh, and the problems as describing them here, yeah, please. Yeah, so in an idealized form, then yes, the peer review is, aims to identify potential error uh, and root that out. But if that information is not available to me as a reviewer, then there isn't a way for me to say, well, gee, there's, that's not the choice I would make, or I don't know if that's a defensible choice, or at least present it, analyze this other way. And so the, those mechanisms require, the, for those mechanisms to work, it requires transparency, to know the workflow, to know the alternatives, to know what, how choices uh, were made. So, yeah. So there are many different types of challenges that can confront it because you know, peer reviewers, for example, are already highly burdened. Uh, so if we say, okay, now what peer reviewers need to do is get the original data and reanalyze it in order to write their reviews, then the 5% acceptance rate for being a peer reviewer would probably drop to near zero. Right? So it, it, there, there are real challenges in saying, yes, the ideal is that peer reviewers can look at everything and reproduce it and do it all. Uh, the reality is that that's not going to quite work. And so they have to have uh, other ways of thinking about how to generalize peer review, make it more open rather than the very constrained uh, process that we have now. And that goes beyond some of the things that I'll say now, but I'm happy to talk about that more. Uh, of all the things I've described here of, as challenges and others, low power, there being more positive results than uh, we would expect, uh, the ignoring of null results. I didn't show you some uh, recent data. There's some new, a publication just came out a few weeks ago in science uh, sort of documenting uh, the file drawer effect in a very effective way um, about how when, I, when labs get negative results, they're much less likely even to write them up, not let alone uh, try to just fail to publish them. Uh, the lack of ethic uh, or incentive for doing replications uh, and the limitations of null hypothesis significance testing, which we didn't get into. Uh, all of these that are the dominating uh, part of the discussion of the methodology debates uh, across different disciplines right now uh, are not new. Uh, they were discussed in the 1950s through 70s in much detail uh, and prior many of them. 
uh, for the challenges facing the discipline for getting a reliable uh, research literature. Also, those same publications offered solutions which are the same uh, as the solutions as we're talking about them now. We need to increase transparency. We need a stronger clarification between what is confirmatory versus what is exploratory. Uh, we need more value of replication in places for people to publish those things. We need to publish no results, et cetera. Uh, so if the problems have been understood uh, since the 1960s and the solutions have been understood uh, since the 1960s, then what, what's the problem? Uh, and the, the issue, I think, is that there isn't an error with the identification of problems and solutions, but rather the error or the, um, what hasn't occurred is appreciation of how implementing the solutions has to take stock of the incentive structures in the ecosystem as it exists, as it faces my choices every day as a practicing scientist. How is it that I can uh, pursue those solutions and still survive and thrive in the discipline? And for us, that comes down to a core challenge, which is the incentives for my individual success are overwhelmingly about me getting it published, not about me getting it right. I am incentivized to make it the most clean, beautiful, positive novel story I can. And if that sacrifices some accuracy, there are very few implications. Uh, and that doesn't mean that I'm doing it deliberately. It doesn't mean I want it to be inaccurate. I didn't get into science to do inaccurate research. I got into it because I'm curious. I like to work on problems. I like to discover true things. But I also need to get a job, and I need to keep that job, and I need to continue to survive and thrive and feel good about my progress in the field. And those factors are real factors that face individual researchers every day if they want to survive in the field, especially when they perceive the rest of the field as not doing it according to those ideals. If everyone else is willing to cut those corners and do those things in order to get publications and remain active, then I can choose to stay ideals with the ideals and then drop out of science, or I can adopt some of those practices and potentially succeed. Uh, so there are a number of challenges that face us in actually making headway into trying to address that incentive challenge. One of them is the perceived norms gaps that we just discussed at the beginning uh, between what we think others are doing and what we perceive our own values to be. A second is that we have these fantastic frontal lobes that can make whatever is best for me the right way to do it very easily. Right? When I'm confronted with the five different ways we analyze the data when we're digging into it, the one that actually looks best for the outcomes that I need suddenly becomes very compelling as the right way to do that analysis because I can bring to bear lots of great reasonings and justifications in order to make that the right one. And I'm not even necessarily aware that I'm doing that. Right? Also, uh, you don't know what happens in my lab. Uh, you only see the final reports. And so when we're in a situation where we have lots of flexibility in how it is we approach our analysis, what it is we report, uh, if only what you'll know is the outcome, then I have no cause to self-reflect on would I make this same decision if I knew others were watching me? If I was observing myself doing this, would I say that's the right way to do the analysis or that's a defensible choice or whatever else? Uh, and so that perspective taking doesn't occur as easily uh, from a lot of literature demonstrating this uh, when we are without uh, accountability or any notion that we're being observed. Uh, and the other primary challenge is that I'm busy and so are you. It's great to talk about ideals and how we ought to do things and how wonderful science could be, uh, but we have stuff to get done today. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff to get done today. And any new practice that you ask me to do, most of the time I'm just going to say no, uh, because I've got the way that I do things and I'm effective, at least I think I'm effective in the way that I'm doing them. Uh, and so adding to that workflow or disrupting it is something that is very difficult. Inertia is very powerful because of the efficiency gains uh, that we perceive get into it from it, at least in the short term. And so all of those challenges have to be addressed in any tools that get brought to bear, and they have to be faced directly in any way that we're going to think about the incentives that need to overcome them. Uh, and so I'll talk just briefly about a couple of different uh, thoughts about different incentives uh, to try to address this, uh, and then we'll close so we can have a couple minutes uh, for discussion. Uh, one of them is just based on a very simple fundamental process of signaling. Right? When you want to promote a behavior, especially when that behavior is already valued, is that you provide signals of when it occurs so that other people can observe those signals as indicators that it's possible to do the behavior and that there is value uh, by, from the community in some way for doing that behavior. 
So badges becomes a very easy means of doing that. Uh, so uh, there is an open community, you can join it if you would like, uh, that calls uh, supports, uh, that is developing the specifications for what makes something open data, what makes something open materials or code, what qualifies something as pre-registered. And journals or other entities can adopt these badges as options for authors, for example, to apply for. Say, I've, I meet the open data standard, I'd like to get uh, the badge uh, on my article for that. Uh, and that then becomes a signal uh, for, I, w I did that, this project uh, has that. So if a journal adopts that, Psych Science is one of the adopting uh, journals of the badges so far, uh, then what it does is it signals that it cares about these things. Psych Science cares about open data and open materials and pre-registration. And then it provides information about who is doing those things. Uh, and just seeing that, even if it's in a small minority of cases, if it's a valued practice, it makes much more difficult a lot of the initial barriers to doing those behaviors, right? I don't do it because it's a pain in the neck to do it and there aren't ways to do it. Well, those are getting undermined by the fact that Pam Mueller and Dane Oppen Danny Oppenheimer are doing it. So there must be some means of doing it and there's evidence that other people are doing it. Uh, so those are ways to promote a practice in a very simple way, very low effort. Uh, and we are, have technologies behind these where the badges themselves are baked with information about the issuer of the badge, uh, about the DOI and other indicators of the article so that they can be digitally tracked and they can even become linkable to the data uh, or the materials or the pre-registration uh, itself. Psych Science hasn't integrated that yet, but that's coming. So that's one. Uh, a second is a uh, model called registered reports. Uh, and this is the cartoon version of the research process, right? We design a study, we collect and analyze data, we write a report, then we publish it. Of course, there is an important barrier in that process, and that is peer review. Uh, the basic idea of registered reports is to move peer review from after the research is already all done, and there's nothing that can be done about it other than make it as nice as possible for reviewers, so hopefully they won't uh, hate it, uh, and move it uh, to the design phase. So peer review and registered reports is done with the, the research question, the methodology, the, just, the analysis plan, all of the justifications for why it's an important question, why we need to know the answer regardless of what the outcome is, um, and how it will be tested, and what uh, quality assurance will be included. Uh, so, and then if it's accepted, it's conditionally accepted regardless of outcome. So if you follow through uh, with what you said you're gonna do and the peer reviewers uh, suggested was needed, and if the non-outcome relevant outcome criteria, showing that you actually tested the question, the manipulation worked, et cetera, if all of those uh, check out, then the, the journal guarantees uh, that it will publish uh, the report. So this shifts incentives in a number of ways. One, making it possible to publish negative results on questions that are of importance because you don't know what the outcome is, so it's going to uh, be published regardless of, of that. Uh, it lowers the barrier to doing things like replications because all that they need to do is submit a design uh, and rather than run the entire study before finding out that it's not possible to publish it because no one cares about that. Uh, and it's also an opportunity to distinguish confirmatory approaches from exploratory ones. So in the registered reports model, it does not hamstring us from now looking at, once we did the analysis of the, uh, that we registered in advance, uh, we can also then do all of the kinds of exploratory analysis that we ordinarily do with most of our research. Uh, you just have to report it as a distinct part of the results section. So here's the confirmatory test, and then here's our uh, additional analyses, and then our discussion is whatever consideration we have for what we learned uh, from that process. Uh, so there are many occasions where this isn't an appropriate design, but as a complement to the traditional peer review process, it offers an opportunity to do strongly confirmatory designs and to get a lot of error and design quality things addressed in advance of actually doing the research rather than after the fact. So there are 13 journals so far that have adopted this as a submission option. In fact, one of them, Comprehensive Results in Social Psychology, is just launching and they're only publishing registered reports. Everybody else just has this as a submission option. Uh, we have um, uh, published a special issue of 15 of these in social psychology, I think in May uh, of this year. Uh, and it was very instructive as a process uh, for how this works. And so if you wanna talk about that, happy to do so. Perspectives on Psych Science is doing a prominent version which is only for replications. Uh, and their first one came out of Jonathan Schooler's ver ver verbal overshadowing work. 
Uh, and then eLife is doing this for our uh, reproducibility project on cancer biology. So all of those projects are being peer reviewed in advance by eLife, a life science journal, uh, before uh, we do them. Okay, uh, so let me just close uh, with a couple comments noting that any of these uh, ways of trying to address incentives can't be done in any single or uh, uh, part uh, because the ecosystem sort of reinforces and sustains many of the things uh, that drive individual researchers' behavior. And so there are many groups that have to be involved and to coordinate in order to think about how might we improve my ability to succeed in the field while also trying to approach uh, the ideals of how we think uh, science ought to be done. Uh, so for example, uh, universities might think about what do they make explicit about their search and promotion processes uh, to try to reinforce what they would like uh, their researchers to be doing uh, in order to achieve uh, tenure promotion uh, in their institution. Uh, and also there is, uh, it's very clear that it is important that the that scientific disciplines do something about this because the concern has extended very broadly and very vertically about the reproducibility of scientific research. So this uh, Federal Register, this is the least read journal in the world, the Daily Journal of the United States Government. Uh, it, um, uh, the Office of Science and Technology Policy issued a memo uh, on uh, you know, the end of July uh, this year uh, and there's like 29 things where ask for information, request for information, so anybody can submit comments. Uh, and this is what uh, the offices in the White House do when they're getting ready to act. Uh, they send out public requests for comments on these different issues, uh, and then they develop directives or commands or whatever it is they do for the various federal agencies that they oversee. Uh, and one of those, oops, uh, it was given the recent evidence of irreproducibility of a surprising number of findings, how can the federal government leverage its role as a significant funder of scientific research to most effectively address the problem? Uh, so the government is prepared and getting more prepared uh, to act. Uh, and there are a variety of this, the, our funding agencies are already doing things. NIH has many new programs in order to try to address uh, reproducibility. So the, um, if we're going to have an impact on how our discipline operates, we need to be part of that conversation. Uh, and the federal government without, um, without guidance can make decisions and offer solutions that we would find to be not productive for the way in which we would like the science to work. Right? The IRB uh, system, for example, is one uh, where there were lots of decisions made without consideration of the realities on the ground of how that stuff actually works. And that one actually is a success story now because there's some very rational changes happening uh, to the IRB process. Uh, but this one has the potential to go very badly because stuff will happen. So if we don't get in front of it as communities showing that we already know how to address these challenges or how to do this well, uh, then it might be done to us and we might not like that outcome. So for us, the main goal is to address this perception or reality gap that the values that we aim to have in our daily practice are also ones uh, that we see uh, visual signaling evidence that others are doing and that we are all uh, reinforced for pursuing uh, a kind of research community and practice that is aligned with what we want uh, the science to be. Uh, so I will close with that, just acknowledging the, the team so far uh, at the center and then remind you that if you are looking for a job, uh, we have lots of job openings. So thanks very much for your time. Appreciate it.